Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. No need for lengthy introductions today. We have the incumbent three-term governor of the state of New Hampshire here today and a ton to talk about from the state budget to the pandemic. And we'll get to some politics too. So welcome, Governor Chris Sununu, and thank you for joining us on Close Up. Thank you. Let's start with one of the biggest big ideas in your proposed budget, merging the university and community college systems. Usually when there are mergers, there are efficiencies gained and dollars saved, but a lot of times that means job losses. So how many jobs do you expect to cut through combining the two systems? Oh, I don't, I'm not expecting to cut any jobs, really. This this was done. There are efficiencies, of course. I mean, the obvious efficiencies of bringing IT systems together, uh, having your faculty under, uh, you know, one uh, one unified system. Uh, there's a variety of different ways that you can find efficiencies. But this was really about the customer, right? It's really about parents and students to make sure that their experience is seamless so that they aren't just stuck. You know, we have 11 great institutions here, but there are 11 of them, and they're all different. Why can't we have one, one institution, one system, if you will, that a student can move in kind of seamlessly from research and development to hands-on projects from one side of the state to the other? That's a modern uh, education system. And look, we're going to see declining enrollment in our two systems uh, if we do nothing. That 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 data, those demographics are on the table. It's been studied and analyzed. So we're, what COVID has really done is accelerate the inevitable, which is you have to adapt. You have to adapt your system. And I think this is a great opportunity opportunity because we're not in a crisis mode yet, but we will be. And the best time to fix a system is before you hit the crisis. You know, if you try to fix something when you're in a crisis, you're just reacting to the crisis, right? Whereas, you know, if you're proactive about it and can de design something that really fits the needs, the long-term needs of the students, that's where you're going to find not just efficiencies in the system. Uh, it's not about cutting jobs or anything like that. It's just about creating more opportunity and a more seamless transition for the student. So there's going to be Two administrations, two chancellors, still two IT departments? No. No, no. What I'm going to first do is merge the boards together. Uh, take a few folks from one board, a few folks from, from one board. There are two boards of trustees in the community college and the university system. Create a new uh, board. And really, we'll give them kind of an outline of our ideas, but let them really design the system. Give them about a year uh, and then bring bring everyone under, under one umbrella. Now, the campuses will still have their own brands. They'll still have their own dynamics. Everyone will be a little bit different. But for the student, it should be seamless so that they can not just transfer credits from one one institution to the other, but move seamlessly within one system. Um, it's just it's just about adapting. Uh, you know whether it's online learning, right? Do we need 11 institutions doing all their own online learning? Well, no, no, they shouldn't be competing against each other. There should be one unified system. Uh, they're going to have enough comp competition from the private sector as is, and we have great private institutions as well. But for the public institutions of the community college and the university, uh, we're going to have, a, you know, a single uh, kind of a single entity. So they're really creating that that process and that opportunity for students, not just here in the Granite State, but I think from all around the region, I think it could be a, a real opportunity to bring uh, more students Students into our system. Mental health is getting level funding in your budget. Once again, a priority is the ER boarding crisis. Unfortunately, this is something that hasn't been able to be resolved. So explain, you know, you've made this progress in DCYF. Why hasn't the state and specifically why haven't you as governor been able to end the ER boarding crisis? So before COVID, we got the ER boarding crisis. At one point, it was up around 90. We got it down to, I think, three or four people, like literally waiting for about a half a day. So we, I don't want to say we had solved the problem, but we had found the right path. That was around January and February of last year. Then COVID hit and you had the isolation issues for not just kids, but the elderly and, and a variety of other issues that, that sprung up and everything got compounded. The other issue with COVID is that we have a lot of our workforce, a lot of our staff are on quarantine or they had COVID themselves. So we have a lot of our beds, our more community driven designated receiving facility beds uh, or some of the beds for kids in, in more um, appropriate community settings as opposed to an emergency room. Some of those beds right now are not being filled because we just don't have the work Workforce because there's just a workforce uh, shortage there. So there's a variety of issues that really took us from a great place as we were tackling this crisis early last year and really compounded it. Um, you can't just say, well, we'll wait for COVID to be over and then everything will go back to normal. No, we're going to be aggressive about it. We know there'll be a lot of needs around kids, especially in schools. And we talked about Charlie Olson and, and his program to really talk about the stigma of childhood depression and what's going on. And we're going to put millions of dollars behind some of his ideas and initiatives. We're going to put a lot of money behind um, a 
initiatives for the elderly and retirees and veterans with mental health issues because we know that if you're elderly that isolation issue is also being compounded through covid so there's no there's no one size fits all i we've put contracts out for community programs that nobody bid on we were doing that a couple of years ago and it was shocking and what we found back was even pre covid it was hard to get the workforce which goes to why i'm i'm put making a, another push it was taken out of my first budget but the student debt relief program, which doesn't cost taxpayers a dollar, $10 million to incentivize healthcare workforce, mental health workers, biotech, a variety of different industries to stay and work in New Hampshire to build those that workforce that we need to tackle problems like mental health, issues around DCYF, issues around substance use disorder. All these issues require people, right? Require that hands-on, one-to-one uh, service, if you will. And when we do that, we can do it really well and, and make a lot of success. But it all, you know, it's just an example of all these puzzle pieces have to really come together to make this successful, but we can do it. You just mentioned the mental health of children. Uh, of course, we know so many kids are stri struggling with the isolation of remote learning during the pandemic. You want schools to reopen. Once the vaccine supply goes up, why not just call an all out blitz and get teachers over the age of 45 vaccinated just to remove that obstacle? And we know there's a fight over this, but if it's a top priority of the kids, why not just try and do that so you can get kids in the classroom maybe April, May, June? Well, two things. You don't need a vaccine to open classrooms. That The CDC has said that, and the, and the Biden administration has said that. Uh, we have seen that model play out all across the state with most schools open without any vaccine for, for teachers or kids. They're open. They're doing it safely. They're doing it successfully. We don't have massive outbreaks. So the model's there. Any school that says we can't open without a vaccine um, is just wrong, uh, just completely wrong. And that's why you see so much frustration on the parents' end. Uh, Group 2A, that comes out, we're in 1B now, the next group of vaccine is only for teachers, right? So we're going to get there with the only other group that we have prioritized in any way, but there's no reason schools cannot open today. So they have to open, they should be opening safely. Uh, we are gonna make an all out push, not on the so much on the vaccine side, that's already being done because they're the only other group being prioritized. Everyone wanted to be prioritized. And the only two groups we prioritized really were first responders, healthcare workers, and teachers. But if we really First responders, see healthcare workers were 1A and teachers were 2A. So, um, you know, these doors have to be open for these kids. It's about the whole health and wellness of the child. If we had massive outbreaks in schools, that would be a whole different story. We don't. We just don't. And so there's really no leg to stand on when the teachers union is fighting this. I have teachers all the time calling me saying, we want to be back in the classroom. The superintendent won't let us. We want to be back in the classroom. Union leadership is fighting this every every step of the way. So it's it's not a, I, I feel for those teachers. And I, and I, God bless the teachers that have kept their classrooms open in those districts that have done it because they've met, been a model for everybody else. It's just time for the teachers union to stop this fight. Nobody, nobody agrees with their arguments anymore. They've been proven wrong time and again. Get the doors open for these kids. Let's talk about the vaccine rollout. It's been widely reported that several states took a look at the VAM system last year and said no thanks, uh, and they turned around and walked in the other direction looking to create their own solution. That sounds a lot like the kind of stuff that you usually like to do. Why in this case didn't you do that? Well, again, you know, we're, we were the only state without any sort of vaccine registry uh, as of last summer. We were the last state in the country because the legislature had never authorized it before. They authorized it. They allowed us to build it. So we started building the process. We knew that we had to get something ready by December. So we said we'd try the, the federal uh, scheduling system. We tried it for a couple months. It didn't work. It stinks. And so we're not gonna, we're not going to sit on it and, and just, you know, hope it gets better. We're going to, again, accelerate what we're doing on our end, get our own system up and running. Um, we've made this process much easier. Folks don't have to schedule their second dose anymore. We're going to take that care of that for them. Folks that were scheduled out in April and May, we're moving them up with our new partnership in Walgreens. And as we get more vaccine, we're calling folks, moving them uh, further ahead in line. So we had about a five day scheduling snafu. Uh, we got through it, but we're not we're not settling. So we're going to get our new system up and running for the subsequent phases of the vaccine rollout, make it a one stop shop, much easier process. So yeah, we, I mean, we tried the federal system, it didn't work. But we're you know, when the, when the feds don't come through for you, you got to really kind of challenge yourself to create your own path. How concerned are you right now about school vacation week? It seems like a lot of people will be traveling to have vacation. Of course, that's their right. But we could see those COVID variants really come back here with a vengeance. Uh, we, we could, and, and I suspect we're going to see variants. I Again, I, I need to emphasize, I think we're going to have COVID 
high levels uh, that kind of come and go, waves of COVID for the next year. There's no doubt about that. The key is really making sure that those that are vulnerable to those sim- to the symptoms that come to reduce the hospitalization and the fatality, that's what we have to get down. And we're already seeing those numbers be cut in half in just the last month. And we're going to keep on that, that very positive track. So the, the end game isn't to get rid of, I mean, it would be great to get rid of COVID, but that's not likely going to happen in the next year or so. We have to get things open safely and we're going to do that by ensuring that you may get symptoms, but if you can, if you get the vaccine, you're not going to be hospitalized. You're not going to have the fatality rate if you can get the vaccine and, and let it do its thing. And that all three vaccines are completely effective in that in that process. And I think that's what gives us a lot of confidence that we can get out of this very very quickly. How much of a problem are you seeing with unused second doses? People who don't show up for that second appointment, and what happens to those second doses if they don't show up? So um, there is a slight percentage, it's three or four or five percent that people that aren't showing up for their second dose appointments, um, that what we do is we hold it and we get on the phone and we call them and we say, hey, Jim, why didn't you show up for your second dose appointment? But we will hold it for a few more weeks to be sure. Um, at some point, we, we're, we don't want it to go bad, so we'll, we'll put it back into the system, but we'll hold it for even weeks after that they are, are supposedly due for that second shot. We'll reach out to them on the phone. We'll try to get them in. If folks refuse, they refuse. I mean, it's their right to do so, but we're not going to let anything go to waste. Yeah, you just mentioned the possibility that we're living with COVID for, for longer than people perhaps are mentally prepared for. I remember one brief uh, last year, you were talking about that, saying, you know, this this could be our reality for some time. There's epidemic, there's pandemic, and then there's endemic, which means it's here for the long haul. What have you been told by epidemiologists about the chances that COVID-19 could become endemic for us here in New Hampshire? Oh, I think there's a, a strong chance. Look, we still have H1N1, right? You know, we still have versions of, of things that had been kind of smaller pandemics and, and smaller issues, be, you know, years ago, but we we just, we, we still have them. We deal with them a little better. We can manage through it. We have better vaccines for them. Um, we just create ourselves more management tools, better, better therapeutics, whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm expecting, because no one really knows. I mean, regardless of what the epidemiologists say, and, and I think most of them would agree, we will likely have this for some time. But it's about getting all these other tools in the toolbox to help manage it and make sure people can, can manage through it. We minimize that hospitalization or loss of life, maybe even bring it to zero. I mean, these are some of the most effective vaccines and the fastest vaccines the world has ever seen. That's very exciting. Um, so, no, I think people need to understand we're going to have ebbs and flows of COVID for, for quite some time, uh, but it doesn't mean we can't get back to normal. We really just have to take care of our most vulnerable population first and then work through the system from there. Okay, Governor, hang tight there in the Executive Council chambers. We'll be right back with more from Governor Chris Sununu. 